everyone. Welcome to Data Umbrella's webinar today. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then Brendan is going to do his talk. And then uh, for Q&A, um, you can ask questions along the way, and we'll make sure that they get answered, whether intermittently or at the end. But we will find a way to answer all the questions. And this webinar is being recorded. I will share the link to our YouTube, and it's usually up in less than a day. Data Umbrella is an inclusive community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are volunteer run. Um, I'm a statistician, and um, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or GitHub with the same handle, Reshma S. We have a code of conduct. We want to make sure that this is a, you know, a safe, welcoming place where people want to be and keep coming back to. Um, so uh, please uh, keep that in mind, and also that applies to the chat as well. Uh, there are various ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct and contribute to making it a you know, the community that we'd like. And you can join our Discord and ask any questions there or share events or whatever. Um, the link to the Discord is on our website. Uh, we also have an open collective, so um, donations can be made there. We have a lot of videos on YouTube, and we have a few um, Playlist. One of them is contributing to open source, and we've done presentations with NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, Core Python. So, um, if you're more interested in, you know, if you're interested in open source, check those out. We also have a career advice playlist, um, which is um, very popular, and we've had three great speakers. So, check that out as well. Whether you're looking for advice or looking to get into a new job. And this is just a sampling of some of the events that we've had in the past year. We also have a job board, so feel free to post any jobs there or subscribe to the job board for updates. Uh, if you are looking for a job, check it out. If your company is hiring, feel free to uh, post jobs there. Our website has a lot of different resources for open source, um, guides to inclusive language and allyship. These are all sort of dimensions that contribute to making it the kind of community that we would like. So check it out for um, all these resources on accessibility, responsibility, and more. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. Um, the ones that are most popular are Twitter and LinkedIn, where I share a lot of job postings. Um, Meetup is the place to go to find out about upcoming events. So, um, you know, if you like if you like these events, uh, feel free to join our Meetup so you can find out about upcoming events. Um, YouTube, I'm going to share the link in the chat, and I've mentioned the job board. Um, oh, I need to reboot the slide. It's a duplicate. Oops, I think I'm going backwards. I know. Uh, there we go. So we have a couple of really great upcoming events. We actually have a lot of events scheduled for the rest of the year that I'm really excited about. And so the next one, which is on September 7th, which is the day after Labor Day in the US, is When Quitting is Good. It's a fireside chat with author Kanur Bahal, and I am reading her book right now, and I think it's um, going to be a great conversation. So um, I'll share the link to that in the chat as well. And our next, another event that we have is with Andreas Miller, who is a, a co-maintainer of Scikit-Learn, the machine learning library. And uh, he has a new library called Dabble, which um, is called, the presentation is taking the edge off of data science. So it helps with exploratory data analysis before we get to the machine learning part. And I've also, um, I've used that library and um, I'm excited about it, so. Today's talk is going to be visualizing data, get to know Bokeh, which is a um, Python visualization library. And um, our speaker, oh, I think I spelled your name wrong, sorry. It should be B-R-E-N-D-A-N, I think. Uh, sorry about that. Brendan is a software developer with expertise in data science and geospatial technology. He is founder and principal at MakePath, which is a spatial data science firm in Austin, Texas. Um, in, in addition to being an active contributor on several open source projects, including Data Shader and Bokeh, he most recently created the X-Ray Spatial Library for Large Scale Spatial Analysis. And he has previously worked at a number of companies, including Anaconda, NASA, the Nature Conservancy, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
And you can find Brendan on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. Uh, Twitter and GitHub is Brendan C-O-L. And with that, I am going to turn over the camera and mic to Brendan. Great, great. And uh, Rishama, thank you so much for the introduction and also the opportunity to present to the group. Um, being able to participate in, in a project like Data Umbrella and seeing what you guys are doing is, is really inspiring to us at MakePath. And uh, it's an it's a awesome opportunity for us to evangelize some of the tools that we're passionate about. Um, I'm going to be talking about Bokeh, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, Risham, are you able to see my um, uh, GitHub profile page right now? It is loading right, yep, now we can see it. Great, great. Um, so uh, so again, thank you guys. Um, as Rishama said, I'm uh, Brendan Collins. Um, I accept any name that starts with BR and is masculine. So Brandon, no problem. Brent, Brian, uh, no, no worries. Um, and uh, I uh, love open source software. I've been contributing to open source projects since the um, about 2011. I got into data science and software engineering through geography. I had um, a, a focus on mapping and spatial analysis, and I realized that I needed um, software to be able to scale the types of things I wanted to do. And that's how I started is, is just um, finding a problem that only automation could solve. And in my case, my first issue was, you know, 100,000 zip files that I needed to open that all contained climate data while I was working at the Nature Conservancy. And I got into Python that way. And I've really um, loved uh, continuing to uh, work in the Python ecosystem. So this is a very Python focused um, presentation, just to let you guys know, um, even though Bokeh does have two components, and we're gonna go into Bokeh, but just a, a little bit about myself, we mentioned um, X-ray spatial. So at MakePath, we're um, uh, working on a open source spatial analytics library called X-ray spatial. Um, I'm also the author of the King JSON Bible. If you wanna do some uh, natural language processing on the Bible, you can grab the King James Bible um, in JSON. And then uh, also um, Data Shader is one of the projects that I absolutely love. And, and hopefully we can look a little bit about at Data Shader towards, towards the end here. But today we're gonna to be talking about Bokeh. Before that, just a little bit more about MakePath. We're based in Austin, Texas. As Rashama mentioned, we're a spatial data science firm. Uh, we uh, love open source tools and uh, ac across many ecosystems, not just Python, but we have a, a major focus in Python. Um, and if you wanna learn more about what we do, you can go over to the MakePath blog um, and you can see some of the, our recent activities, including participating in uh, the SciPy uh, 2021 conference and other projects that we're working on with, um, with both clients and, uh, and our open source contributions. Um, we are hiring. Uh, we have a bunch of different positions, uh, ranging from um, front-end developers that uh, specialize in JavaScript to um, back-end developers that we tend to use tools like Django and um, uh, you know, Nginx and, and typical open source Python web uh, software, and uh, also some machine learning positions. And so if you don't see something on here, you, you can still reach out to me and, and uh, I'd love to connect with folks. I, I also you know, enjoy connecting with folks just to bounce around ideas about your career. It doesn't have to be specific at MakePath. Um, I, I had to traverse this ecosystem myself in terms of getting a job as an analyst and then as an engineer. And so I'm always happy to, to chat with folks. You can reach out to me uh, via email or LinkedIn or, um, or GitHub and happy, happy to chat. So um, today we're gonna be talking about Bokeh. Bokeh is a visualization library that allows you to build rich visualizations in the browser. Um, so we're targeting the browser here, but we're coding in Python. So you're able to uh, stay within a common analysis language, a lang language. So Python being the one of the predominant languages for data science, you can do um, your uh, data um, cleaning, your analysis, and then your visualization and keep that visualization inside of Python. And that's one of the, the major value propositions of Bokeh. But we're targeting in general, um, the HTML5 canvas with Bokeh. 
although there are other back ends, um, uh, other visualization engines tied to Bokeh. So there's also some, some really nice WebGL support. But um, the idea here, and we can see uh, a, a small, small example, is that you can build interactive um, applications from Python, which get um, rendered in the browser. And that means that there's two components to Bokeh. There is a, um, a JavaScript library, and that is the bulk of Bokeh. So if you look at the number of lines of code and um, where, uh, uh, where a lot of the, the algorithms are implemented, you'll see um, that written in uh, JavaScript. And then there is uh, bindings written in Python so that they have all the classes and um, uh, that you interact with within Python. So that means that we're creating a specification for a chart and then we're converting it into JavaScript for you. So you don't have to necessarily write JavaScript. So this can be, there's a, many applications that are using um, Bokeh, two in particular. So um, the Dask Diagnostics Dashboard for folks that are unfamiliar with Dask, Dask is a concurrency and parallelism library for Python. Um, you, in a naive way, you could think of it as analogous to um, Apache Spark. So uh, the area of Dask that I think about is a lot about horizontal scaling or taking in an analysis and scaling it up. The um, uh, dynamic dashboard that they have for diagnosing what's going on on a specific worker was built using Bokeh. Um, Panel is a library which allows you to wrap multiple viz libraries from the Python ecosystem and uh, um, compose them into dashboards. It's a really nice high level library for creating dashboards, um, also very uh, focused on Bokeh. And then we have Microscopium and also um, Chartify as other examples of folks that are using Bokeh. Um, so this is just the bokeh.org. It's a good place to start in terms of in looking at the library and there's a lot of links off of here. Um, but let's go back a little bit and just talk generally about the Python ecosystem. So one of the libraries that most data scientists using Python would be familiar with is Pandas, which gives us that data frame uh, abstraction. And um, Bokeh ties into the larger Python data science ecosystem. So it understands things like Pandas data frames and NumPy arrays natively without having to, to do much magic at all to say, load up a CSV into a Pandas data frame and then visualize it using Bokeh. Um, we were briefly, uh, Rasham and I were briefly talking about um, Pandas and I, would, I was mentioning kind of date time support um, and some of the great things that Pandas um, has in it. And that's one of the things I just love about the, the about open source software in general is cross domain collaboration. So Pandas is a really nice example of a analysis library that came out of the finance domain that then um, got extensions for things like Geo, where we use Geo Pandas all the time. So I love mapping and I love spatial analysis. Um, pandas and geo pandas gives us the power of the data frame, but also things like spatial relationships. And that's what, what geo pandas gives us. So um, just a little note on other tools within the ecosystem uh, that you should be familiar with. And I'm guessing a lot of folks here are familiar with pandas. Um, there are a lot of different plotting tools within Python. Um, that's an aspect of things being open source and um, tools coming out of um, of different places. Matplotlib is one of those foundational tools that uh, that we all kind of looked at as as being a um, uh, a just very highly used library um, for visualization and data science. One of the the areas of Matplotlib that Bokeh was trying to address is interactivity and targeting the browser. So in Matplotlib, many times you're generating a, um, a static output, like a PNG or an SVG. But in Bokeh, you're generating HTML with embedded JavaScript and CSS. Um, that means that data can also be embedded um, in Bokeh. But I just wanted to highlight Matplotlib um, as a, uh, another library that, that we all use. It's built into um, uh, pandas when you call uh, dot plot on the pandas data frame. So there's a lot of different tools to use within um, any ecosystem and, and Bokeh is a good one if you're trying to target the uh, web browser. So uh, Bokeh, a little bit about Bokeh's history. Um, uh, first off, 
Bokeh was created at Continuum Analytics, which became Anaconda, and uh, really came out of a library called Chaco that was created by Peter Wang. Um, Peter Wang also started Bokeh, but then Bokeh was 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 uh, really grown and, and developed through the guidance of Brian Vanderden. Um, so big shout out to the folks uh, that have worked on Bokeh throughout the years, and we're going to take a look at the Bokeh GitHub page in a sec. But the um, uh, and please ignore the Whole Foods ads here, which are very uh, targeted to my taste. This ice cream's looking great. The, now Bokeh was based on a book called the Grammar of Graphics, and if we think of um, a library from the R ecosystem like ggplot, what does the GG stand for in ggplot? And uh, I believe it's Grammar of Graphics. And so in in this um, in this work here, which for the low, low price of $130, you can get off of Amazon. I, I'm sure you can get it used um, cheaper. Uh, but this lays out a lot of the vocabulary for how to talk about plotting. What is a glyph? What is a grid? What is an axis? So a lot of the, the, the naming conventions that are used within Bokeh all started from this book called The Grammar of Graphics. So just a plug out there to um, to go and, and get your, your copy of, of Grammar and Graphics and read through that to, to really see um, where Bokeh is coming from. But Bokeh has has uh, uh, has moved away as you know we keep adding things and there may not be a, a, a specific answer inside of Grammar of Graphics, how to name something. But this is uh, the foundation for, for Bokeh, which is also um, related to ggplot. Let's dive into Bokeh. So right now um, I have a Jupyter Notebook session up. And while you can create static HTML files from Bokeh, you can also render Bokeh plots within the Jupyter Notebook, which is nice for my sake because I can present them and go through code and I can um, work on code at the same time as seeing the outputs from the code. So this is a, um, a Bokeh quick, quick Start Notebook um, and I can show you guys uh, where to get this. But we can see, I'm going to make my font just a little bigger here. We can see that um, uh, there's an in, some initial imports that we're, that we're doing. So uh, within Bokeh, we can start by importing a figure. And there's a, there are several different APIs for plotting. But figure is the API you'll want to start with. So from um, Bokeh plotting, we can import figure. And this is a little bit of, um, of notebook magic here which is that if we're going to be using Bokeh inside of a Jupyter Notebook, we just need to call this output notebook function. And as I'm going down the cells, right, I'm hitting my shift return so that I execute a cell and then I move to the next cell. And I can see that Bokeh has successfully loaded. Now to start plotting, let's get some data. And here we're going to see um, Bokeh support for uh, tools that are common in the Python ecosystem like NumPy. So, so on the x-axis, we can we can generate a numpy array in the linear space of 100 elements between negative six and six, and then we can take the cosine of those of those elements. And here we're going to see our first um, bokeh plot, where we've instantiated a figure, and that figure is going to organize our our plot and then allow us to add on glyphs, and that's what we call them within bokeh our, our glyphs. So in this case, we're using the circle glyph. And then we're passing um, the data for the, uh, the x-axis and the y-axis. And we're starting to set some visual properties for appearance, like size and, um, and color. As we add in um, color, we are in, right, we're in HTML, CSS world. So we can use any of the 147 CSS colors here. Um, so fire brick is one of them. Um, but we could also use something like uh, saddle brown. Um, and so those are named CSS colors. Um, there's also um, color ramps that are supported, and we'll see a little bit more of that. Um, and we can also set properties like alpha. So alpha would uh, control our uh, transparency or, or the flip side of opacity and uh, allow us to add some, you know, to set 50% uh, opacity on, on our glyphs here. And then we're calling the show function to actually render this plot into the browser, which is inside of a Jupyter Notebook. And what we get is we get our plot with our data as, as expected, but then we also have going down the side here some different tools. So by default, we have the pan tool selected so we can move the plot around. 
But then there's other tools here, like the mouse wheel zoom, which would allow us to zoom um, axes, which would also work on individual axes. So here um, I've put my mouse on the x-axis and I'm um, changing the scale of the x-axis. So this is a, 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 just a very basic um, bokeh example of creating a figure, adding some glyphs, and, um, and then showing it. So we have uh, a nice bar chart example here using um, some automotive data that is looking at um, different cars by their make and also their miles per gallon and a bunch of different dimensions of, of cars. Here we're adding uh, a few more glyphs. You can see the use of a vertical bar or a V bar uh, for looking at the um, uh, at some stats, and we can see the use of the circle. We already had that one triangle, and so there's a there's many different glyphs that are available within Bokeh, but they're all added onto uh, a figure. So we've instantiated a figure, and now we're adding um, our glyphs onto that figure. We're setting a couple of other figure properties, and there are a bunch of figure properties that, that you can find as you uh, um, dig in here. But here we're placing the legend on the top left. And we can see some, uh, some other um, small, small things here, like for instance, um, putting a legend label for this specific uh, glyph. And then we can see in our legend that we have American and we have a triangle for the, for the, uh, for the make, for the maker of the, of the car. Um, so this is a quick start. Um, there's some linked brushing in here, which is cool, um, which allows you to uh, link axes on different plots, and we can see that quickly. But um, in the interest of just keep it, keeping it going here, so here's a here's a linked plot. So we can uh, take a dimension of one plot and link it to another plot. And so we have. Um, let's get this this example going. And so here. The uh, we need one tool. So what we're doing, how how we ended up achieving this is we have um, this lasso select tool and this box select tool. And so sorry to have a problem with this. So as we go over to these tools, which got uh, slightly hidden, we can select features um, from one plot, and then we can broadcast that selection to the other plots. Um, and highlight those those uh, those glyphs or those elements that were selected on one of the, one of the plots using that lasso tool. Although there's also a box select tool um, where you can do that using a uh, a rectangle. Um, we saw something called output notebook, which is going to render plots to the notebook itself. But you can also save them down as um, as HTML, and this can be really helpful because the data is embedded in the HTML. All you have to do is then take this and put this in a web accessible directory, and you have a URL to your plot, which is which is uh, really nice. That also means that you could send this HTML to a colleague, and they could um, see your visualization with the data um, from that HTML document. Also means that these HTML documents can get large, so you want to probably avoid um, committing um, large HTML documents to Git. So if you're rendering a plot with a lot of data, it may be good to set .html in your git ignore to, to not um, commit those files if they, they'll, uh, they could get fairly large depending on the amount of data that you put in them. Um, so here we just generated a, this bar plot as standalone HTML by using output HTML and then opened it in a new tab. And so we have these same tools available but we're, but we're now outside of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, there's also a um, Bokeh Server component. I'm not gonna go too deep into Bokeh Server, but there is the ability to run a process on the server side that, re that responds to interactions within the Bokeh plot. So say you click on a glyph and you want to send out a email based on cl clicking on that location or clicking on a button, um, you can write that logic within Python and then access it using Bokeh Server. Um, Bokeh Server can also do things like streaming data. If you have a, a streaming data source and you want to continually update glyphs in your plot, then you can connect it to Bokeh Server and Bokeh Server will handle the streaming component of doing the updates. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a lot um, 
built within uh, Bokeh JS as one of the main, uh, the, the major code bases of Bokeh JS is the JavaScript side. And the Python side is, is relatively small compared to Bokeh JS because it only contains uh, wrappers or bindings for Bokeh JS. That means that you can also build um, Bokeh bindings for other languages. And there's been implementations for R and for Scala. Um, but there's a, so if, you know, if folks really, you know, want to, want to bite off um, going deeper into Bokeh, you can see some of those implementations in, in R and in um, Scala of how to actually build Bokeh JS bindings. Um, I wanted to just take a, a quick sec to show how I would get set up here because we're going to look at um, um, uh, some additional Bokeh tutorials. So a good way to start, so if you're starting from scratch with Bokeh, a good place to start would be to install Conda. Um, Conda is a, is, a, is a great tool for managing um, Python, isolated Python environments, but then also um, as a package manager for installing packages. Um, you can find um, documentation pretty easily on installing uh, mini Conda, which only includes um, the Conda tool as opposed to a lot of other packages, like uh, scientific software packages that are available within the Anaconda Python distribution. But here you can find um, uh, some downloads on actually installing Conda. But let's set up a quick environment for, for running Foke tutorials. So I'm gonna start by, sorry, having a little, little frame right here. So I'm gonna start by creating a new environment um, that's called uh, Data Umbrella. And I'm gonna set this to Python 3.9. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a new environment. So I'm using Conda Create, call, naming it Data Umbrella Demos, and, and I'm asking for a Python 3.9 uh, in Python interpreter. So this is gonna be an isolated Python interpreter that will only be for the purposes of, of this demo. I'm gonna accept yes. And so now this is um, going and installing um, Python 3.9 into an isolated location that then I can then activate this environment. So it gives me this nice little command here that I can copy and paste. So I've created an environment. Now I'm going to activate that environment. I can see on my shell that my shell has changed to show my active conda environment. And then we can go ahead and install um, Bokeh. So a couple of interesting flags, you can give it a Y for when you're doing a Conda install, you can give it a Y to automatically accept yes. We can look at custom channels. So I'm gonna grab Bokeh from Conda Forge and um, then I'm going to just type uh, Bokeh. And we can also put in Jupyter because we'll have the Jupyter number. So this is going to go um, to the Conda Forge um, repository for pulling down packages and find the version of Bokeh and Jupyter that works for my, my, um, my operating system and my, you know, the, the version. So I'm uh, Python 3.9, I'm looking for Bokeh, I'm on OS X, and that's what Conda is resolving right now for us. Um, once this downloads, we'll then have a, um, uh, we'll have Bokeh and we'll also have a Jupyter notebook, and we can go, we can go to our next area of looking at um, the Bokeh Notebooks repository. And so take a, take a note of this one, and I'm sure it will be in the, in the notes. But um, for, uh, for this video, um, in the future, if you happen to lose this, but this is a really great Bokeh tutorial that's available from the Bokeh organization called Bokeh Notebooks. You can download all of the notebooks here, um, just going to download zip, or you can, um, uh, actually clone this repository or fork this repository if you're thinking about making changes uh, or updates. So here we've um, we've got Bokeh now downloaded and installed. Um, and so we can look at, um, Bokeh comes with a, um, a, a small CLI that in particular can help you get um, sample data to run um, Bokeh charts. So we have a bunch of different um, Bokeh commands here. One of them is serve. So this is for doing um, Bokeh server, which I mentioned for the streaming cases and, and interactive callbacks, but we're gonna run Bokeh sample data. So this is a, a nice place to start, which is downloading Bokeh sample data. So we're just gonna run, run that. I've already downloaded this ahead of time. So I already have all these data sets, but here we have a bunch of different CSVs. We have some shape files on the geo side, some financial information. Um, and uh, uh, also there's some, some XML data here. So 
this is a, a great place to start because you'll get all the data, the sample data for running um, content in the notebooks. Um, and then um, go, you know, going ahead and, and getting your, your bokeh notebooks. And then we would run a, um, a Jupyter notebook session, or it could be a Jupyter lab session. So I've, um, I've downloaded the notebooks and I've started up uh, the Ju Jupyter. I can see that there's an index notebook here that's a, a, a good place to start. And we're going to see um, the there's a link to the Bokeh Quick Start Notebook, and that's what I showed at the beginning was the Bokeh Quick Start Notebook, and also some tutorials on getting set up, which I just led you guys through in terms of uh, getting a uh, Conda and then installing Bokeh and getting sample data. Um, now we have a lot of different notebooks in this tutorial, and so this is a, a you know this is what a great Friday night you know get a cup of hot chocolate and sit down with the with Bokeh tutorial and um, and uh, so that's a you know a nice place to start. Is just get all these notebooks and start working through them. But as I mentioned, you know it goes through what what um, bokeh is and the fact that you don't need to know JavaScript to build beautiful visualizations in the browser. And that's one of the things bokeh offers. And we have um, a, a nice example here where we use um, a bokeh column data source. And we're going to see this throughout the notebooks. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, column data sources. So the, the column data source within Bokeh is a data structure that wraps a uh, rows and columns. So when we think of uh, that data structure within Pandas, it's the data frame. The data frame is a data structure that inherently understands rows and columns. It knows you're dealing with rows and columns. The wrapper for that in Bokeh is called the column data source. And in the other um, examples that we showed, uh, when we added glyphs, we were passing explicit NumPy arrays. So we passed in our first example of doing our linear space and then our cosine, we pass a NumPy array of X values and we pass a NumPy array of Y values. Here, once we have a column data source, we're able to pass just the labels or column names. So let's look at the example of, um, we're still looking at automotive data here. We're doing a factor plot and we're breaking this down by the number of cylinders and manufacturer. And uh, so the how we actually wire up the data to the glyph is done using a column data source. So we see what we did here. We did some imports. We did some data transforms in terms of setting some types. We did a, a, a group by on two different fields on number of cylinders and manufacturer. And then we when we use our column data source, we all we do to instantiate it is to pass a pandas data frame to the column data source constructor. And um, then uh, we have our source. We can supply that to any of the glyphs on top of figure. And here we see our source indicated here. And now all we do is refer to um, a, the name of the column within the pandas data frame or in the column data source. Um, by its label. And that's a that's a, a really nice to do one for readability. But that also means that you can do calculated transforms. Say you wanted to add a column called color and you had very custom logic on what colors were assigned to which observations in your data frame. You could supply color as a string to um, to the say line color or just color depending on the glyph. And then it would look inside of that column data source and pull out that color for that element. Here we also see the, the use of, um, of hover and the hover tool. So as I look at um, these bars, we can see that we can see the miles per gallon and the number of cylinders and the manufacturer. That hover tool was added by um, uh, instantiating a hover tool instance. Um, you don't always have to do this, but you can do this for uh, if you want to set custom tooltips. And we're passing in um, key value pairs for, uh, for what content will be in the tooltip when we're hovering over an area. In this case, we're using this, um, uh, the at, sim the at uh, miles per gallon mean to refer to that column within the column data source. Uh, while MPG is just a literal string. So this is a slightly more complicated 
um, bokeh plot that uh, shows doing a group by and then also assigning uh, color to to uh, to dimensions. So this slider, I think, uh, let's see if this this will embed. I had a little trouble with this earlier because I think the bokeh demo server was having trouble. But here, we're we're now we're we're linking to um, uh, to bokeh demo .bokeh .org, which has a bunch of running bokeh server examples, and we can embed these inside of a notebook. Um, so this is now, as we interact with these controls, we'll see the plot update accordingly. Um, and that's part of the interactivity here. So uh, Bokeh wraps a bunch of different widgets from range sliders and text boxes and drop downs um, and also custom CSS so that you can uh, respond to user actions um, and update a plot or, um, or re-query something. I mentioned a little bit about the setup on um, cloning uh, the Bokeh Notebooks repository. There's a there's a bunch of other notebooks in here that uh, that really show um, how to get started with Bokeh. But then, if you want to go deeper into Bokeh, I would recommend checking out um, going to Bokeh uh, GitHub. And so now, this is not Bokeh Notebooks. This is Bokeh proper. And inside of the GitHub repository, we can. There's an examples directory. Let me make this a little bigger for folks. So inside of Bokeh examples, we have tons and tons of examples, um, which might be great places to start. So if you have a idea for a visualization, maybe it's so unique that no one else has ever done it, and um, you really need to start from scratch. But it could be that there's a bokeh example that you can find to, to start with as a template and then uh, swap in your own data and see where it goes. And so this is a great place to find um, exactly what, what it says, bokeh examples. So if we look at um, this color sliders example, then we can see all of the code that was associated with building this example. And we can take it and we can put our own data in. So as you think of, of, hey, I want this, this specific type of interaction. In this case, this is a Bokeh server application. Um, so the Bokeh, Bokeh GitHub is, is a, uh, a central place to find these Bokeh examples. And there, there are many, many of them. And this is just one directory inside of plotting. But there's also um, uh, some nice WebGL examples. WebGL um, has made really some really, really great updates in the last year, but is still not supported for all the glyph types. So as you see all the glyph types, those apply to the um, HTML5 canvas renderer, but uh, there's also WebGL rendering for, um, for a subset of the, of the glyph types. So there's um, uh, some additional notebooks here on theming and styling um, using the, the HTML5 uh, five CSS col named colors, additional properties, and also exercises that you can go in and, um, uh, and play with a specific feature inside of Bokeh. Um, data sources and transformations. And so there's a, there's, there's a, a nice spot where you can iterate in your, uh, in your data exploration using Bokeh um, where you can uh, say select certain features that might appear to be outliers um, and use that selection to then iterate on your analysis. So Bokeh plays a, a, a big role also on kind of the data cleaning side. I use it all the time to just like look at histograms and understand um, the structure of data as I, as I dive into a project. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the notebooks that you'll find here. Um, I'm going to wrap it up, and I want to leave some time for any questions folks have about Bokeh, but wanted to mention um, the Bokeh developer docs. Uh, so we've been working a lot on these developer docs to get uh, folks up and running on contributing to Bokeh, and we're, re we're really looking for new contributors to help out all the time. Um, it's a great community of, of people, uh, and you can learn a lot um, uh, on, on seeing how this library was built. And let me just go real quick and mention that um, that right now, like there's there's different ways to judge open source projects. But when I don't know that much about an open source project and I come to the GitHub page, I'm, I'm many times attracted by the stars, and that's you know it's it's nice. It um, it glitters, but I'm more interested in the number of contributors in the project. 
So in this case, Bokeh has over 500 contributors. So I know that this library is going to be supported into the future because there's a lot of folks that are already contributing to it. So I'd urge everyone to get involved. If you have not contri contributed to an open source project before, you're unfamiliar with Python, or you're unfamiliar familiar with coding altogether, um, starting with looking at um, documentation can be really helpful, and starting at um, with with testing is a great area to make contributions without necessarily needing to know the whole code base because it can be intimidating to jump into a project that you're unfamiliar with. Uh, so what I what I would do is come over to the issues area. Um, and then there's a label over here um, that is um, good first issue. So you can come over to Bokeh and you can click on good first issue and you can see some of the issues that might be appropriate for a first time uh, contributor. Uh, but um, yeah, just wanted to open up uh, the floor for any questions folks have about Bokeh or, or really uh, any anything else that I presented and I'm happy to, to answer them. Hey, um, I can um, read some of the questions. Um, the first one is, what is the Bokeh project that you are, actually, sorry, the very first one is, is Bokeh similar to ggplot2? Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a, many different analogies that you can draw between Bokeh and, and other viz libraries. Um, it's a very similar space. Um, Bokeh, Bokeh uh, I'm not that familiar with ggplot2 uh, specifically to be able to like, compare and contrast at a feature level, but I guess I would say yes. Okay, the next question is, what is the Bokeh project that you are the most proud of or excited about? Um, so I'm most excited about uh, empowering researchers to uh, be able to create plots using Bokeh that are publication quality. We've been having interviews with academics to understand what the pain points are in uh, being able to visualize their results and communicate insights that they find. Um, so being able to support the academic community in uh, streamlining the process of getting ready for publication um, submission is, is the area that I'm most interested right now on the bokeh front. And that uh, has a lot to do with LaTeX and SVG support and making sure that folks can say, take an analysis and generate a plot and then be able to uh, share that analysis and generate that plot with a colleague and have that streamlined right into a publication. That's, that's, a, that's a, I think a vision that would really help folks. Yeah, I think that's really important because with a lot of uh, different sort of tools, I produce like you know, I produce a graph, but I'm like, it's really the resolution isn't great enough to put into you know a publication. So there's it's definitely where there's a huge need. Mm -hmm. um, the next question we have a question: Does Bokeh support daytime annotations on hover? For example, if the points are some measurements on specific date and time. Yeah. Um, so one, you can all it, it we support uh, general strings, and you can always can use the date time formatter to format a string, a date time string into say the time zone or the um, uh, or the format that you want, whether it be like year, month, day, or month, day, year. Uh, and so uh, one step that you might think about is to transform your data to add a, a string column in. Um, or you can um, just use the date time objects themselves. But yeah, there's there's good date time support here. Great. Um, another question is, how do you choose between using different data viz packages or tools in your day to day work? I I think that there's um, like some of the tools that I look for are tools that are easy to get going with, but then allow me to go deeper as I have uh, new needs. So this, to me, the Bokeh plotting uh, API, which is using figure and the glyphs that we're showing, um, helps me get going quickly. But then I can go deeper and even extend Bokeh with user-defined models, and I can define my own objects, and I can go to a deeper level. And I've had to use that on occasion, where um, uh, a certain feature doesn't exist in Bokeh, and I can easily wrap some JavaScript in Python code and add it. Um, so I, I would say that that fragmentation in terms of in tools in an open source ecosystem is challenging, certainly challenging on the JavaScript front, although it's gotten a lot better. Um, I think that that there's great tools for Python and, and all the tools make the ecosystem stronger. Like I really like Plotly, 
Um, I, I use Bokeh because it's what I have more experience with and it's what I'm more kind of committed to in terms of development and, and contribution. But matplotlib is great. Ultimately, we want to think about the problem that we're trying to solve and then work backwards to the tools that best solve it. And it's not always straightforward. Like if you're coming at this fresh, you may say, well, um, there's, a, there's good support for Bokeh. There's a lot of contributors. Um, there's a lot of examples. That's where I'm going to invest my time and, and learning and go deep into this tool. You can have the danger of starting and stopping with many different tools. And um, instead of going deep into one to, to solve a problem, you keep trying to figure out what is the absolute best one. And I think that um, there's a, you know, a danger in, in switching in retooling too often. But um, between, you know, I think Bokeh, Bokeh is great for general purpose viz and even building web applications. As I build larger front end applications, like so say we're getting into like a medium sized application and we're around, you know, um, 30 to 50,000 lines of code in like a, a, a medium sized application, Bokeh would not be my choice for that. I would probably write that in, in JavaScript and use something like React or Vue.js to, to create a, a large uh, or medium sized application. But for a small dashboard that I want to expose to users and allow them to tweak parameters of my model, um, Bokeh is great and it's fast. Uh, next question is, uh, you may have covered it, but can you just mention a little bit more about WebGL? What is it and some more about it? Yeah, so um, WebGL um, came along with um, HTML5 really, and it's it's had um, uh, adoption by the browsers for uh, supporting different um, different features within WebGL. But basically, what it is is a graphics language for the browser that's a, that's analogous to OpenGL. So as we think about graphics languages, um, you know, there's some things that come up. It's a very uh, working inside of a graphics language at the base layer is very different than working on um, with other tools that you may be familiar with, like uh, with Python. I mean, for one, it's not a Turing, graphics languages tend not to be Turing complete. So there's a different way of thinking in, in interacting with a graphics language versus, um, you know, a Turing complete programming language like Python or, or, or JavaScript. So uh, WebGL is another rendering engine inside of your browser that um, has now has very good support across browsers. It was not used in the beginning because there was features there, but they wouldn't be supported across all your different browsers. So then you'd have to come up with shims for each browser and it was just too much of a, of a headache to deal with. But now we have good support for it. And those graphics languages really do well at drawing graphics to the screen. That's what they're designed for. So when we're using, say, Canvas, um, the HTML5 Canvas, I render around 5,000 points. And I feel like that's, that's fine. Um, I think we get too much larger than 5,000 points. You start seeing the frame rate going down as you're, as you're um, panning or zooming. But um, with Bokeh and WebGL, I can get you know, 200 to 500,000 points um, on the screen. But then the interaction with those points is a little reduced, so it's, it's slightly harder to um, interact with those points in terms of like setting up um, other, say, tool tips. And there are tool tips in, in the web WebGL, but uh, it's a you get better performance on rendering at the expense of interacting with a more difficult language. Um, but for instance, there's only there's there's all the glyph types. That's why we have a limited set of glyph types for WebGL. Is that each glyph type has to be implemented differently for WebGL? For instance, like lines were originally in Bokeh WebGL implemented as triangles. So like we're in, we're 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 interacting with a very different programming paradigm. And what you'll see within WebGL and WebGL languages are wrapper libraries. So we think about like. If you look at 3JS, for instance, that's a wrapper library around WebGL, or Glue 2, which was the original uh, WebGL dependency that, that Bokeh used for interacting with, with uh, WebGL. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but know that the graphics languages in general is an, is an area of visualization that, that you might be interested in checking out if you want to go deeper into Viz. So after you, um, 
you know, understand how JavaScript works or you understand how um, Canvas works, WebGL would be a would be a good area to to check out for for more um, uh, for larger visualizations that that you need additional render horsepower for. Uh, the next question is concerning your uh, LaTeX support connection. Are there already ways to include the interactive plots in LaTeX slash PDF? Um, so you can, right now, there is um, there are some bokeh, there's some decent examples of using something like HTML to PDF with plots. So looking at PDF, PDF specific tools, there isn't like a PDF export from bokeh that just renders everything to a PDF for you, but there are tools, intermediate tools that would help you like HTML to PDF and um, being able to build up an HTML document and then adding it into a PDF. Also within, I, I, I would just, I believe within like say Acrobat, you can add in um, links and iframes. So iframe is your friend. I showed one iframe example where you can use an iframe to embed a bokeh plot because at the end of the day, it's just HTML and JavaScript and CSS. So you may run into some problems in PDFs where um, where it doesn't want you to execute JavaScript for um, security reasons. So there are some specific things about PDFs that could be problematic. But um, uh, but yeah, so you're you're at the end of the day, you're working with HTML and um, and so there's a lot of other tools that support that standard that that you could use in uh, in conjunction with Bokeh. Okay, so there's a question that was answered in the chat, but I think it's worth uh, saying so people who are watching the video can follow is, in summary, using Bokeh, it is not necessary to use JavaScript directly. A Bokeh uses it in the back end. Is this correct? Exactly. That's exact, And that's one of the main value propositions of Bokeh is that you're able to build rich visualizations in the browser. Um, without having to contact switch and then start writing JavaScript. So you can stay within your analysis language and you can finish with a rich visualization that you can share with colleagues without having to contact switch. So I had a question, which is, um, what is it about the visualizations that make them being, you know, um, publication ready? Like what is the challenge that makes that difficult? you know, like why it isn't already um, in existence? Well, I, I mean, I think that there's there's tools that, uh, I, I think that publication quality is is slightly subjective depending on on who that researcher is and what their standards are in, in terms of publishing things. And obviously the publications have a big say in that also. But looking at workflows where like when I talk to researchers and I say, like, walk me through what it was like to generate the um, graphics for that paper. And I think what you'll see is that there is um, fragmentation in tools where someone will say be in R and generate plots, but then they'll go to, say, Adobe Illustrator or they'll go to another um, uh, another place to create the similar outputs. Um, and so I, I think it's a workflow issue, but we certainly want Bokeh to be part of that workflow and support that workflow. Um, so specifically on the Bokeh side, um, like when we were exporting um, PNGs, they wouldn't have uh, the resolution that folks needed. And so talking to researchers and saying, okay, like you need um, uh, LaTeX support, you need uh, SVG support, for, and finding out, okay, if we had all of these things, would you be able to go from analysis to publication ready in the fewest number of steps? Um, that's my two cents on it. I'm not saying that, that that's just kind of my opinion on, on why it's, it's, a, it's an issue is that there's um, researchers are using many different types of tools. Um, there's a lot of different types of data that get added and um, annotations. And um, there isn't always, you know, the, the, the most direct path to getting the output that you need for the publication. I think one other issue, at least when I took a data viz class that might, might be like five years now is that, and we, we would go to Adobe Illustrator as well is because the annotation feature wasn't available back then. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems to become more available for more of the libraries, I think. Is that right? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, so if we look at, say, adding annotations inside of Bokeh here, um, we can, uh, and this is what we had for a while, but we're able to um, to link in to a, a data frame to add those annotations. It's one thing if you can, if you have a, uh, if you generate a nice plot in Illustrator based on analysis that you do, but what happens when the data changes and you need to go back and you need to iterate and um, that's where it'd be really nice, you know, to to not have Illustrator in that workflow and stay within your analysis language and get those outputs that you need. Um, and so this um, this adding annotations notebook um, covers some of that, um, and you can see how to link up a um, a column data source to an annotation on um, on the page. And let me just actually find find one that shows it well. So here, you know, adding in um, some labels onto points. But that's one of the areas where we need to put in equations in here that are supported by by LaTeX, and so that's that's the one of the areas of focus. And um, Yuri, who's actually on the call right here, has been working a lot on that. So big props to to Yuri and and Mateos and Brian Vandeven and all the other folks that are contributing to Bokeh to make make LaTeX support happen. So that you know that leads, this is actually a huge step forward for reproducibility in science as well, which is why, you know, because some of these tools can be disjoint, it's hard to reproduce it and verify it and all of that. So that's, that's really important too. Yes. Yes. And uh, so I, I, I think that, that I'm, I'm not fighting a battle to say like, Hey, you should use Python over, over R or use um, Bokeh over Plotly. Plotly is a great library and if folks are using Plotly, and, and are, are successful with Plotly, that's great, but we can find spots within Bokeh that we can you know, make it easier for, uh, for researchers to use who are, who are one of the, the primary user bases for Bokeh. Yeah, that's great. This, if anybody has any more questions, uh, now is the time to, um, to ask. Um, and just a reminder that this is being recorded and um, I'll, I'll share the link once again in the chat. It's on our YouTube for Data Umbrella. Should be available in less than a day. Um, yeah. Any other any other questions? Go once, go on twice. Okay. All right. Um, so with that, I want to thank um, Brendan for joining us. Uh, it was a great presentation, and um, I'm actually looking forward to watching it again and checking out Bokeh Library. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for having me here, and please, please reach out. And um, I would just urge everybody to um, try contributing to open source projects, no matter what your skill level is. There's a there's a place for you to to help out and contribute. Thank you.